Hello and welcome to the Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armudian. In this hour, one of the most fundamental features of the Trump administration is a policy of limiting immigration and reversing U.S. policy on work visas, asylum, and deportation policy. What is the status of this policy in light of recent U.S. Supreme Court decisions and the COVID-19 pandemic? Contributing host Doug Becker explores. I'm Doug Becker. This term, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the Trump administration's attempt to repeal the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, was unconstitutional. The Dreamers, as DACA recipients are nicknamed, were originally protected from deportation by an executive action during the Obama administration. We will discuss this case, as well as several other cases, dealing with U.S. immigration policy with Peter Spiro, Charles R. Wiener, Professor of Law at Temple University. He is author of Citizenship, What Everyone Needs to Know. And Hiroshi Motomura, Susan Westerberg Prager, Distinguished Professor of Law at UCLA. He is author of Immigration Outside the Law. Peter Spiro, what is DACA and what exactly was decided in this Supreme Court case? So DACA stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. And it was a program adopted by the Obama administration, in effect, giving a kind of protective status to a, a community of several hundred thousand individuals who entered the United States before they were 16 years of age and who satisfied certain other requirements. They're basically what in the popular parlance are known as the dreamers non-citizens who entered the United States illegally at a young age and who grew up in the United States and are still present in the United States. So those are the um, so-called DACA beneficiaries. President uh, Trump attempted to rescind the program and that rescind, rescission is what was at issue in the case as it presented to the Supreme Court. And Hiroshi Motomura, this seems to be fairly consistent with Trump administration policy on immigration since his election in 2016. What exactly legally do you see the Trump administration trying to accomplish broadly with immigration policies? Well, there are a couple of ways to think about the Trump administration's attitudes on immigration. Some of it has to do with uh, its, ad- its, its response to unlawful immigration. Some of it has to do with its response to, uh, to legal immigration. So the Trump administration has taken a, a very hard line on things like the border wall, uh, also on interior enforcement. There are a number of things we could talk about that are in that general category. The Trump administration has been particularly skeptical of asylum claims, refugees. And then it's also become clear that the Trump administration is skeptical or hostile to the levels of legal immigration that we've had. And that's manifested itself in responses to to some non-immigrant visas, in other words, temporary workers, for example, um, also some of the, the legal immigration categories. And then it shouldn't be forgotten that the Trump administration has issued some uh, executive orders and proclamations that target um, some majority Muslim countries, um, a number of other countries, especially in Africa. So that's a lot to cover. So in a sense, the rescission of DACA or the attempted rescission of DACA fits into a larger immigration agenda. So Peter Spiro, DACA was an executive action. I remember when it was announced, it was particularly, Republicans were particularly critical of this as an extension of executive power. The Trump administration's argument was that they can rescind it because since it's an executive order, they should be allowed to rescind it. Why weren't they allowed to do that? Well, it actually wasn't an executive order. It was a so-called executive action. So it was implemented through a a memorandum by the then Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano. And in the ordinary course, you're absolutely right that an executive action by one administration can be reversed by a subsequent administration. What the Supreme Court did in in validating the rescission is to call the Trump administration on its process. That if you're going to undertake this kind of reversal, you have to jump through certain hoops, you have to consider certain factors, you have to act in a way that, to use the um, jurisprudential vocabulary, is not arbitrary and capricious. 
And what John Roberts found in his opinion in this case is that in fact the administration's action was arbitrary and capricious. This was an administrative law decision, not an immigration law decision. As in some other cases, for instance, the census case involving the citizenship question, the Supreme Court is in effect calling the administration for just not doing its homework. But not, but this was not a decision on the merits of the DACA program. In effect, what the Supreme Court is saying is punt is um, handing it back to the administration and saying, you can do this, you just have to do it right. You just have to do it the right way. And that's what the Trump administration apparently is now uh, going to pursue is uh, uh, undertaking the rescission, uh, but making sure that it's crossing all its T's and dotting all its I's here. So Hiroshi, do you think that it's likely that this program would be repealed if Trump is reelected in 2020? If we're talking about a second Trump term, I think that um, it's quite likely that, that they'll go through with the rescission. You know, it's hard to say, but I think that what's stopping the Trump uh, administration from going through with the rescission immediately may be the election, right? Because of the popularity of DACA, because of the time, that little time that's left before the election and that process. But if, yeah, if we're looking at second Trump administration, I think that... Uh, you know, we don't ever know these things, right? I mean, this is all a question of speculation, but right. it, put it this way, it would not surprise me at all if we uh, we see a rescission. I mean, one of the things that I think was evident in the way the Trump administration tried to go about the rescission was they tried to do it without taking responsibility politically. They basically said, well, you know, we can't do this. We can't have DACA. Um, they kind of tried to shift the responsibility to the court system and by saying, well, we can't keep this because it's illegal in, in the court. You know, like Peter said, kept uh, the administration from, in a sense, shifting responsibility, you know, to the courts. And so I think if we're talking about a second term, I think the administration would feel empowered to uh, to end DACA. The other complication, though, is that uh, DACA has been always been part of the, the politics of immigration. And so we could easily see a lot of negotiation where the uh, administration tries to do something for dreamers, but the price is uh, you've got to fund the border or a wall or something like that. I mean, this is one of the issues with, with dreamers. It's always been uh, issues with regard to this group of uh, young people has always been tied up in larger questions of funding for ICE, of funding for the wall, how we treat asylum. It's all kind of politically so intertwined. And Peter, one issue that's sort of been in the forefront for me in thinking about this is that in many ways, if DACA is rescinded, it was a bit of a trap for DACA recipients because part of the deal was that they had to come forward and you know, provide all the information necessary to the government to become a part of that program, making their deportation so much easier. Is there any legal uh, requirement for the courts or for the administration to consider the way in which a, a DACA recipient could have been a bit, you know, to use a common parlance, that they've been set up to make it easier for them to deport because of their need to report their, their, their status to the government. I'll defer to Hiroshi on the legalities here. I think it's highly unlikely that the Trump administration would, assuming that it would be permissible, that they would systematically go through the DACA roles and just start rounding DACA beneficiaries up for deportation for exactly the reason that Hiroshi says that this is that the, the Dreamers are a very popular group. And there's actually a pretty broad consensus that some number of them, uh, that their status should be regularized. And it, it's a matter of politics and, and the refusal of the Republicans to do this as standalone legislation that has um, been the main stumbling block. But it would be a very bad look for the Trump administration to go around and to deport otherwise completely innocent, productive, fully integrated members of this class. Yeah, Hiroshi? One of the issues that's been brought up in this litigation, in this case, is, is and there are multiple cases trying to stop the rescission of DACA, but one, one of the issues that's come up is trying to block the government from using this data or personal information that people submitted in connection with uh, their original DACA applications. And so um, that issue did not go to the Supreme Court. I mean, what went to the Supreme Court 
um, was the question of whether the administration went about the rescission properly and, and gave a full accounting for what it was doing. Another issue that went to the Supreme Court was whether this was discriminatory. That's, that's um, an issue that, that's in the courts that did not go to the Supreme Court is whether or not this information is protected in some way. Now, the, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals for the basically the Western end of the United States said that there is a, a claim there, a strong claim that that information is protected. So that's still, you know, being fought over. I agree, though, with Peter politically, uh, it would be, to say the least, to tra- attract a lot of negative publicity if the administration started going through and rounding up uh, DACA people. But, you know, there are a couple things going on here. One is that the information that was given uh, is also information that might be uh, used to find parents, sort of really track who's living where. Depends on how much energy and resources they want to put into that. And the other, though, is that I think it does... Uh, create a great deal of fear in communities, um, the, the threat of DACA information being out there. I know that a lot of people now are um, really, ever since Trump came into office, been concerned about filing paperwork because uh, the information will be out there and there's been a, a stronger practice in the Trump administration than ever before to say that if you apply for something and we reject it, we might actually put you in deportation proceedings, even though you might not have been on the radar before. So, I mean, these are all fears that people have, and sometimes it's the threat or the possibility of action that is more significant practically than whether they actually fall through. And that actually raises an issue that, that's been you know, of a concern, and that was the citizenship question on the census. Uh, the concern was that if there was a question asking, are you a citizen, it would make non-citizens much less likely to to fill out the census form and, and, and not be counted. What is the status of, of that question and the possibilities of, you know, of it being renewed? I, I think the uh, census Peter. forms have gone out and right. I don't think they include the question. So right. that bullet has been largely dodged. But Hiroshi's point is, is very well taken that immigrants now, legal and undocumented, are very wary of interacting with government authorities of any description. One context in, in which this is particularly notable is with respect to uh, public benefits to which they are legally entitled, but um, which they will not seek for fear that somehow it's going to hurt them or relatives with uh, precarious uh, immigration statuses. Just picking up a little bit on what, what Peter was saying is that People who are undocumented or people who are not citizens don't live only with other people who are undocumented or other people who are not citizens. I mean, uh, most families are so-called mixed families, and uh, or many families are. And so if we're talking about a so-called chilling effect on responding to the census or applying for um, public benefits or anything like that, um, it's likely to have an effect on, on U.S. citizens who live in the same household, many of whom are children, but they may be spouses or other family members. We've kind of set this up with an important distinction between the administration's approach to illegal or quasi-legal immigration and questions about, you know, legal immigrants, which compels me to the next issue, and that is this question of work visas. A couple weeks ago, the administration had announced a decision to, you know, to to restrict or, or ban certain types of work visas, and from the political perspective, it seems driven at least in part because of the economic hardships that were caused by by the pandemic. First of all, Peter, what exactly was the administration's decision? Uh, what what types of work visas uh, have been? What types of work visas are they not going to administer, and and which ones are they going to continue to? So there there are two major um, proclamations that President Trump issued under so called Section Two Twelve F which gives the president a very broad authority to quote unquote, suspend the entry of uh, aliens whose entry would be quote unquote, detrimental to the interests of the United States. Uh, The April proclamation suspended the issuance of immigrant visas, including uh, employment-based immigrant visas. And then the more recent, the June proclamation suspended the entry of uh, non-citizens who would otherwise be eligible for J visas, which are for jobs like camp counselors, au pairs, certain kinds of teachers, 
H-1B visas, which are probably in terms of the alphabet soup of non-immigrant visas, they're the most um, uh, familiar, which apply to so-called specialty op occupations. H-2B vis um, visas, which apply to so-called seasonal workers. And then L visas, which apply to intra-company transferees, that is executives who are moved from an office overseas to an office in the United States. So all those visas have been suspended and they've all been justified in these proclamations uh, in terms of employment, uh, the employment um, crisis that's been triggered by COVID. So uh, Trump is ostensibly justifying this as a, that the admitting these visa holders would uh, take jobs away from Americans in a time of urgent need. The empirics for that are pretty close to groundless, but um, this proclamation is very broadly suspend the issuance of uh, an entry of new visa holders. And Hiroshi, do you agree that these are largely groundless? And what do you think the implications on legal immigration? from the Trump administration, uh, what implications should we draw from that based on, the, on these decisions? Well, I agree that they're groundless from an economic point of view in the sense that we're in a situation where, you know, we need the economic engine of the country or the, the world to be robust. And, uh, and that involves uh, having the right people doing the work. Um, you know, this is not a one for one thing where each person coming in from outside the country takes a job of someone in the country. Most of the time, you have a situation where people come into the country and they create an economic situation within a company that allows for the employment of all kinds of people, including a lot of American citizens. Um, you know, I happen to be on a conference call with someone who um, is very, uh, he's a lawyer, but very, very uh, close to and representing some large entities. Large, you know, I mean, he actually was talking about um, representing Fortune 10 as opposed to Fortune 500 companies. And he's saying that the the ban on bringing in um, these so-called L visas, you know, the, the executives is, is really sent a shutter through a lot of the business community saying, you know, we're, we're trying to open up operations and we're trying to make things and we're not, we don't have the people we were counting on to help us, you know, with the know-how or the management or whatever. So, you know, so in, in terms of what it means, Doug, I think that a lot of this is about for a certain, you know, part of the Trump base here, or maybe the whole Trump base, I don't know. It's an argument that's going to win some votes to say um, we're putting uh, the American worker first in the short term, even though it may hurt them in the medium term and long term or even, you know, four months from now. Same kind of thing we've seen on trade, right? That uh, let's, uh, let's impose tariffs and, you know, that would be the argument from the administration. Let's impose tariffs, which ultimately would raise prices inside the United States uh, and make it and lead to retaliation by other countries for our own exports from the United States. And let's do that because that's going to make a few people happy. And that's, that's kind of the trade-off. So we're seeing, we're seeing the same kind of thing uh, in the Trump administration's uh, responses on legal immigration. Um, and this is on the business side. I mean, there's a lot, all kinds of people who are being cut out or kept out on the family immigration front as well. But I think we're really seeing kind of an isolationism economically that's manifested in, in these visa restrictions. And it's also, it's using, mm -hmm. it's basically advancing the restrictionist agenda under cover of COVID. It's clear that the restrictionists within the administration are opportunistically advancing the restrictionist agenda uh, using the, you know, the real concerns posed by COVID as a justification. And th those justifications will stand up in court, I think. So they're learning from their defeats in the Supreme Court in cases like the DACA case and are doing their process with an understanding that that's what they have to do to make things stick. And I think although this use of 212F authority is, uh, is clearly unprecedented, that uh, it's very unlikely that the Supreme Court would, um, would strike down these actions. It reminds me of a um, famous politician who once said, um, never let a good crisis go to waste. <laughs> and certainly the administration's had a lot of things on its to-do list. And uh, the administration has uh, quite opportunistically, as Peter says, uh, used this chance, used the pandemic to do a lot of things that were, I think, quite clearly on the agenda to start with. 
And you could say that, I mean, one message coming out of the Roberts decisions in, in DACA and the census cases is just lie better next time. You know, <laughs> just make sure that you've got some rational justification for the action and that, and that will do the trick. One of the areas on immigration that has certainly been politically volatile and has dominated headlines has been the status of asylum seekers, in particular on the southern border of the United States. And I know that there have been some decisions, again, citing COVID as a justification of these and some of these uh, asylum applications, or at least kind of s slow them down. So I'll start with you, Peter. First of all, what, what is the, the actual policy of the administration and what are some of the legal issues that are raised with the way it's been uh, confronting asylum seekers uh, since uh, it took office in 2017? I mean, the inclination of this administration is not to validate any asylum claims and not to let any of them in and not to extend any process to many of them. The Supreme Court, in a decision that got a lot less attention than the DACA case, just upheld so-called expedited removal of certain asylum uh, seekers in a very broad decision, which in effect denies that aliens outside the United States or in the petitioner's uh, case, 25 feet within the United States, just have no due process rights protected under the Constitution and that they get only what Congress gives them. Um, asylum in, is its own whole world. And I mean, again, I'm going to defer to Hiroshi. One gets the sense that with respect to undocumented immigration, legal immigration, asylum and refugee policy, that there's just so much coming at us that it's, I, I think for even for the advocates, it's hard to keep up with what's going on and uh, and and respond to this activity, but uh, so I'll I'll defer to Hiroshi on the particulars of the of what's going on on the southern border. Other than basically, it's shut. Yeah, Hiroshi it is an attempt by the administration to shut off asylum. I mean, well, you know, one thing that that's just st taking a step back. I mean, um, the United States is a party to an international treaty that recognizes. Um, Asylum protections, uh, refugee convention, um, and so Congress has set up a process um, for deciding asylum claims. And so um, the administration has done a number of things, a lot of things actually that have, in various ways, tried to make it harder to apply for asylum. And I'm sure if I, I, I if I list even a few of them, I'll, I'll, it'll be incomplete. But just to give you flavor for this. I mean, first of all, there was a an attempt um, that wasn't successful, but to make people apply for asylum only at ports of entry, um, then. There's an attempt uh, still going on now that uh, people ha can apply, but then they have to wait in Mexico while their cases are going to be heard. The administration is trying to first say that anyone coming from, uh, well, actually, the, the, the most recent version would say that uh, you have to you know, get shunted off to Guatemala if, if you are uh, applying for asylum. And then the, the administration also, through uh, some administrative law rulings, actually issued directly by the attorney general or different attorney generals, but um, different cases at different times, you know, raised the standards for getting asylum. And, you know, I think that what we're seeing really here is a couple of different things. One is the administration trying to do what it can do without going to Congress, because I think Congress would not adopt these changes. And the second thing is really trying to uh, turn its back on the on the system for protecting refugees, the system that you know emerged after World War II, and so it's been around for several generations. And I think there's a a great deal of um, sentiment in this administration that the United States really shouldn't uh, shouldn't be part of that part of the system, at least as it's played out over the last uh, seventy years or so, seventy or eighty years. So with respect to some of the issues with, with asylum seekers, there's the additional concern uh, from human rights advocates that the ways in which asylum seekers have been collected, the ways in which they've been housed, you know, et cetera, could violate certain, human, certain internationally human rights provisions, uh, human rights norms. Now, I know the U.S. doesn't have a terribly good track record in ratifying human rights treaties, human rights conventions. But is this a fair criticism that not just the question of whether or not the U.S. will process these asylum applications, 
but the treatment of asylum seekers while they await this processing is in contravention to uh, to human rights norms. Ask Peter first. I'm going to pass the ball okay. over. <laughs> Go ahead, Hiroshi. Asylum is is a well, I guess you call it a right, or it's a, it's a it's it's a thing uh, certainly. Uh, protection and it's been inter- recognized in international convention, Geneva Convention um, for protection of uh, refugees, and and uh, that's been incorporated into U.S. domestic law as well. And so, what I think you're referring to is not just the the attempts by the administration to restrict access to the asylum system, but things like the conditions under which uh, asylum seekers are being held. Um, there's a lot of restrictions on practical restrictions on the ability to claim asylum. And this could be a simple thing as whether someone is in detention while their case is going on. And so there, it's all part of the, the general skepticism of asylum claims. I mean, they're, they're small things. I mean, it's, it's one thing I think just to keep in mind in general with this administration is that you have the things that get a lot of publicity, like um, executive actions, proclamations, things like that. But there's a lot of uh, things that are kind of under the radar that are practically very important. Uh, things like putting money into ICE agents, but not necessarily the deciding cases and things like that. So, you know, one, so an example of this that relates to your question about asylum is um, trying to make sure that asylum seekers are kept in detention, you know, essentially for a, a, as long as possible during the period in which they're pursuing their claims, which makes it really hard for them to get legal help. And uh, it makes it more likely that when they explain why they fear for their lives, uh, going back to wherever they're they're from, um, when they when they make those statements that uh, they're not going to have the help of a lawyer, for example, who understands exactly what the legal requirements are, that might lead to someone not saying something that's absolutely crucial and would be the basis for protection. And so, uh, yeah, so th- these are these are issues that are, are serious human rights issues. But I also think that it's important to remember that these are issues protected by U.S. law as well. And they, there's a lot of overlap. Yeah, one, one, one point that Hiroshi makes, which can't be overemphasized, is how this administration has exploited the discretion, the broad discretion that's available in implementing immigration laws in a way that just, I mean, I said earlier that advocate, lawyer advocates are having trouble keeping up with all this stuff. Journalists are spread very thinly on this. And so there's a lot of very important activity that's happening, just not getting reported or it's getting re- reported, especially in the avalanche of, of other news, reported in a way that just gets lost in the mix. I mean, one story just from the last couple of days is that a large number, I, I think a majority of um, employees of USCIS, that is the visa, uh, the benefits granting arm of the Department of Homeland Security, have been put on furlough. Because the fees from uh, uh, visa-related actions no longer cover the budget of the agency. And so they're now getting furloughed, and which just means that fewer of these benefits are being, uh, are being processed. And that's the kind of story that it's just not going to be above the fold um, uh, these days and just not going to be able to generate the kind of outrage that it really should. I, I absolutely agree with you. There's been such a flood of issues in dealing with immigration questions that it's so difficult to try to keep up with all the issues that have raised. And it seems to be one of the strategies of the administration is to flood the news with so many stories. It's difficult to remember some of these stories. So one that certainly comes to mind are the travel bans that Hiroshi had referenced earlier in the show was Muslim majority countries and then a handful of other countries that were added in subsequent travel ban cases uh, because the court had actually called them out. Uh, it called the administration specifically out and overturned decisions because they were all majority Muslim countries. First of all, what's the status of these travel bans? And is there any legal redress remaining to try to address uh, these concerns, or is it th- at this point really in, in the hands of the of the electorate? Hiroshi. Yes, the travel bans are in effect. The Supreme Court upheld them under a very deferential standard. That in some ways the, the administration lucked out 
remember, I mean, it seems like ancient history now, that was travel ban 3.0. Remember they had the first travel ban that was issued during the first week of the administration, which resulted in chaos at the airports and was, I, I tell my students that, that any of them after a couple of weeks of immigration law could have done a better job drafting that proclamation than the Trump administration did. But as a result of the chaos, they had to go back and revise that not once, but twice. And the third time around, they got it, they lied better. And the Roberts court uh, validated the, the proclamation in a way that I think makes it pretty difficult to challenge any of these subsequent proclamations which have been issued under the same authority. So the more recent um, uh, suspensions of entry with respect to uh, certain non-immigrant worker visas and immigrant visas are, were um, issued under the same authority. And the Supreme Court in the travel ban case approved that uh, ban under a standard, which I think will make it difficult, if not impossible, to win in the, the, the courts against the more recent actions. Yeah, Hiroshi? Yeah, I mean, I agree that, um, that the Supreme Court in the, uh, I guess the Muslim ban, travel ban, a lot of terminological argument too, but um, in, in upholding it um, makes it very hard to um, challenge the ban, the more recent ban involved a lot of African countries. I think numerically the most significant country we're talking about is Nigeria. The Supreme Court did leave some, some opening. Well, let me take a step back. Uh, the Supreme Court relied on the fact that you could get waivers. In other words, you can get, you can get exceptions. You can come in in spite of the ban um, by way of exception. And the Supreme Court uh, relied to some extent on the availability of the exception. Now, if it turns out the exception turns out to be bogus in some way, in the sense that it's really nearly impossible to get, it takes forever to get. Um, there's some opening the Supreme Court left for um, the ban still to be struck down as the case goes through the courts um, for a more detailed investigation. But I agree with Peter that the um, Supreme Court set it up in such a way that it's going to be really hard to to go through on those commitments because in the immigration area, you know, once you say the words national security, it's it's hard to it's hard to hard to win against the United States government here. So um, you know that's that's what we're seeing, and um, so we're seeing a confluence of uh, security based reasons with the COVID uh, issues in this zone where um, where the administration can do quite a bit, and um, and Congress over the years has past statutes to give a lot of latitude uh, to, to, to the president. Um, and um, this president has certainly used those powers much more aggressively and much more broadly than uh, prior administrations. Now, I know there's been some international consequences to some of these decisions. The one that recently was announced was the European Union's decision to not allow for American travel to the EU what was cited in the press was concerns that the U.S. didn't really have the, the COVID pandemic under control. But what was always included in, in more meaningful and nuanced discussions is the fact that this was somewhat retaliatory on the part of the EU, that the U.S. has restricted some EU travel, and then a number of Europeans see this as a, as a way to retaliate against the U.S. Can we expect to see more of this type of retaliation to where in essence, though the US is restricting uh, travel, immigration, work permits, green cards from countries abroad, it's gonna be harder for Americans as well to travel, travel abroad. Has retaliation been one of the hallmarks of these policies? I wouldn't characterize the EU's action as retaliatory. It was undertaken on very objective uh, criteria relating to incidents, COVID incidents. Um, and in fact, if anything, the EU is probably pretty wary about, was uh, pretty wary about um, blocking the U.S. because it knows that this administration is, will take it as having been retaliatory in some way, sort of take it personally in a way that might have unintended consequences. But I mean, the world is sort of on lockdown or it's just, it's just, coming out of lockdown I and mean, places that have been most successful in controlling the virus, like New Zealand, just said, nobody's coming in. 
So that complicates the whole uh, picture and thinking about Trump administration immigration um, policies. I think it's really only after the lockdown significantly eases on a global basis that we'll be able to assess, for instance, um, how pretextual some of the administration's justifications uh, have been. But I mean, the main message coming out of the EU ban on US travelers is just, we're doing a terrible job with COVID. And it makes total sense for the EU to limit uh, entry of individuals who have been in the US because you know they're trying to keep a lid. I mean, they've kept, a, they seem to be keeping a lid on it and obviously um, uh, letting people in from Arizona and Texas and other hotspots isn't gonna help them on that front. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what Peter is saying and because um, uh, I wouldn't, um, I mean, retaliation's a you know, hard label to kind of um, justify in any kind of scientific way because you have to dig into the minds of the people who, who uh, make these decisions, but um, and I don't claim to be an expert on public health in the, in the European Union, uh, but mm -hmm. um, I have followed enough to get a sense that their decisions have been um, driven, let's say, more by the public health authorities than those decisions might have been driven in the United States, uh, uh, certainly at the national level. And so, I don't know, maybe it makes a difference that uh, Angela Merkel uh, is a professional scientist, um, or has maybe it has to do with the public health structures in some countries versus others. But that's the reason, I mean, retaliation is a term that is uh, you know, certainly one of uh, political culture and, and not necessarily one of public health culture. And I have, my sense is that the, the European Union's reaction is driven by some um, legitimate public health um, c considerations that are uh, justified by some of the data that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is interesting that to, to, to we're getting some of our own medicine here. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's or maybe that's not the right uh, metaphor to use <laughs> um, in this context. But U.S. I mean, Americans are used to being able to travel without uh, basically any formalities, any almost anywhere in the world. And now that we're subject to uh, travel restrictions, would be I think it sort of brings home maybe not um, uh, our immigration policies, but just how bad a job we're doing with the pandemic. <laughs> Throughout the hour, we painted this picture of immigration policy where there have been some examples of legal restrictions, but those examples really don't predominate immigration policy. I think one of the lessons we take from this is that the executive is given quite a bit of latitude on immigration policy, and that in particular when citing national security concerns, that courts have been generally pretty reluctant to step in, except frequently on process issues, as opposed to on necessarily substance issues. How much of the, the legal response to the Trump administration and the Trump administration itself been an anomaly on uh, American immigration policy and how much of it is fairly consistent with previous administrations, albeit likely taking it further, but the trend, you know, has been in place for the executive, you know, to cite national security in ways to try to restrict uh, immigration. Peter. Hiroshi, you want to go? Hiroshi's one of the leading historians. Oh, absolutely. And Hiroshi, I'll, I'll ask you. For I it. thought Peter was one of the leading historians. <laughs> um, the, well, I mean, there's a lot to say about this. And, and so I just, I'll just kick this off a little bit. Um, I mean, certainly uh, national security has a... Um, you know, cuts a pretty wide swath in these conversations, right? So that's clearly the case. And every administration has cited national security for all kinds of decisions it's made after 9-11. I mean, at various other times in history, sometimes there are episodes that um, with a generation or two hindsight, the, the country regrets. But at any rate, that's, that's, that's happened. Um, but I think, uh, and so in that sense, the, the administration is um, in some sense taking advantage of a longstanding tradition to defer. Um, to the administration, both in the moment, but also by the structure of what the power of the administration or the executive branch has been given. Um, you know, that said, I think the Trump administration um, will be seen, you know, if we're talking about this the 30, 50 years from now, um, as an administration that really um, 
moved away from kind of a consensus uh you know, it's not a, not a not a universal uh, sort of a view, certainly, but sort of a view that um, even if there's going to be back and forth on how hard to be on illegal immigration, that there's something about uh, America's nation of immigrants, and that, that legal immigration is is generally um, a good thing for the economy and for the for the culture. Um, and I think the Trump administration represents a skepticism of that view of immigration, the nation of immigrants uh, view. Um, I mean, it's no accident that uh, the nation of immigrants was removed from the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services website um, as uh, as sort of its 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 uh, you know self identity, I suppose if you want to put it in those terms. So, um, in that sense, I think the administration is taking advantage or using, or maybe I shouldn't put it so pejoratively, as just using mechanisms like citing national security um, that all administrations have used to one degree or another. But I think that this administration has been much more aggressive about that and much more broad about the way it's, it's done that. In that sense, this administration, I think, is an outlier looking back from the period from this administration on back through um, Really, quite a bit of history, maybe before World War Two. Uh, before World War Two, yeah, I can completely agree um, that what sets this administration apart is a change in the culture that uh, prior administrations, uh, Republican and Democrat, have uh, generally adopted the uh, rhetoric of um, of the United States as a country of immigrants that that is as a positive uh, as a positive feature of our traditions. Uh, I mean, Ronald Reagan was hugely pro-immigrant and including with respect to undocumented immigrants, the last major um, uh, regularization having been adopted during his administration. So the, the change in the culture combined with the fact that even through these prior administrations, um, which have been uh, more or less pro-immigrant, that there's doctrine, that there uh, that there are court doctrines and norms, which enable uh, a tremendous amount of executive branch uh, autonomy in the exercise of this authority. And since you can think of the um, prior the precedents relating to immigration as sort of lying or laying around like a loaded gun. That prior administrations, they didn't use the, they didn't use the machine gun. They may have used they taken pot shots, which they understood they could get away with, because of the deference that's afforded to presidents in this context. But the Trump administration is really just a, an assault rifle, um, and because the doctrine is there, the precedent, the so-called plenary power of the political branches is well established in the jurisprudence. They basically gotten away with it. And so one thing that'll be interesting looking forward is assuming and hoping that we have a Biden administration, it's clear that there'll be a very long punch list of uh, administrative actions that will be reversed. Then that will be a top administration of a Biden, a top um, uh, priority of a Biden administration. The question is, well, will Congress, will there, will there be some action to limit the exercise of this authority going or going forward so that this loaded, so that the weapon, at least there's some kind of safety put on the gun um, so that it's not available to future Trumps to, to wreak the kind of havoc that, that, that he's wreaked during his administration with respect to immigration. Well, just a brief add on to that is it's interesting to look at, uh, to look back at uh, several of the opinions in the decision that, uh, uh, by a narrow majority upheld the travel ban or the Muslim ban, whatever term you want to use. And there are a couple of justices that, that essentially were clearly writing, not for this administration, uh, but for presidents in general. And they pretty, pretty much said um, that uh, we have a system that defers the president. If we knew that every president was like this, we wouldn't have that system. But we're counting on not every president to be like this. And so we're going to just... Uh, get through this period and we're not going to diminish the power of the president in uh, general. Um, and in fact, you, you have at least one justice of the Supreme Court in that time 
uh, saying essentially that uh, they don't like what the president is doing, um, but they're going to just uh, bear with it uh, because they're trying to look ahead to uh, the general run of American history and American presidencies. Now, you know, time will tell um, if that was uh, too sanguine and too optimistic a view of the presidency and how the Supreme Court should act in a given moment, in a given case. But uh, it was clear that um, there's the sense of this president and presidents in general. Yeah, I think it's fair to say the court has ruled on this is to treat this presidency as a normal presidency from a separation of powers perspective. And I think you both have highlighted a very important question, sort of two related questions. The first, you know, has the court erred in that presumption? And the second being that it's clear that this is a political question, at least as much, if not more so, than the legal question. And so at the pains of finishing with something cliched, elections clearly matter, and, and the residents of each of these offices matter a great deal. So thank you very much for your insights today. We have spoken about the DACA case and U.S. immigration policy, the role the courts have played, and our guests have been Peter Stiro. Charles R. Wiener, professor of law at Temple University. He's the author of Citizenship, What Everyone Needs to Know. And Hiroshi Motomura, Susan Westerberg Prager, distinguished professor of law at UCLA. He is the author of Immigration Outside the Law.